the word. Good evening. Welcome back to Catalyst, where we are in week two of our series, Whisper, where we're learning 
to hear from God. Have you ever been in a long-distance relationship with someone, or perhaps you have family that lives all over the country or even all over the world? How excited do you get when you hear from people that you don't regularly see, but maybe they give you a call or you get an email? You get really excited when you hear from them because that's a big deal because it gives you that chance to say, hey, this is what's been going on in my life, and it gives them that chance to tell you what's been going on And there's, you can talk about your problems, you can talk about pain, you can talk about um, what's going good in your life. It's just awesome to get to connect with those people in our lives that we don't normally get to see. And well, the the scriptures are pretty clear that God is spirit, so in some sense, there's the sense that we don't always get to see God with our physical eyes. And so when we get to hear from Him, it's this really incredible thing, and it's actually a skill that Christians need to cultivate to be able to actually hear from God. Because if we're in a relationship with God, if we're in a relationship with Jesus, we should actually have a desire to hear from them. Just think back, if if you ever were in a long-distance relationship, my guess is the longer time went on in the day or the more days that went on, you started thinking, I wonder when they're going to call. I wonder when he's going to call. I wonder when she's going to FaceTime. And you get this desire to hear from them. That should be our posture as Christians. We should have this desire to hear from God. And if you have a desire to hear from God, then you also have to have a desire um, to learn how to hear from God. And that's what we're doing in this series, is that we are learning to hear from God. And here's why this is so important. Because um, it's different than being in a long-distance relationship or thinking about our family and friends that are far away. When we think about being in a relationship with God, we're not just talking about someone that we love or that we have affection for. We're also um, dealing with someone that, as Christians, we have given over control of our lives to. So it's different. It's not like a boyfriend or girlfriend. We haven't handed over control of our lives to them. But when it comes to Jesus, he's not just Savior. He doesn't just set you free from your sin. He's also Lord, which means that he is in charge. Like like if Jesus is Lord, it means that I'm not. And it means that you're not either. And it means that you're not in charge and I'm not in charge, but he's in charge. And so if we want to let Jesus be in charge, for him to direct our steps and our paths, then we have to be able to to hear from him. We have to be able to hear from him. If Jesus is Lord, we have to know what he says about the things that we say, about the things that we do, about the decisions that we're going to make when there's a choice in front of us. We have to know what is the the thing that God wants us to do in those moments, and to be able to discern that, you have to be able to hear and know the voice of God. Just imagine, as the pastor of this church, If the staff of this church and the congregation of this church never actually heard from me, you would not know where I was actually leading us. You would not actually know what I wanted for us. You would not know the vision that I had if you never heard from me. And the same is true in your life. If you don't have some sort of discipline, and in the book Whisper, Mark Madison talks about these whisper places, these places where you can go and you can hear from God. If you don't have a regular discipline of getting somewhere where you can hear from God, you'll never know what he actually wants from your life. You'll never actually let Jesus lead if you're not listening. If you never hear from him, you will not know where to go. And so that's why in the the whisper series, we are learning seven ways that God speaks to us. Last week, Pastor Cheryl got us kicked off with talking about Scripture and the the primacy and the importance of Scripture and hearing from God. It is, make no mistake about it, the number one way that God speaks to us is through His already written and revealed revelation of Himself, His Word. It is the number one way. The reason why the series and the book starts off with, with the topic of Scripture is because that becomes the lens by which we look at the other six ways of hearing from God and judging if those are leading us in wisdom or if they're leading us into falsehood. So as we discover these next six, remember that Scripture is the first thing that we run it through because you could listen to some of these other six ways of hearing from God and be convinced that it's leading you in a direction, but I promise you this, These next six ways, if they truly are from God, will not lead you outside of what the Scriptures deem as being appropriate for believers. 
For instance, I've heard and seen Christians destroy their families, absolutely obliterate their families, and claim that God told them to do it, that God led me to leave my wife and me to leave my husband and for us to come together into a new family. And, and they will say, that's God's will for us, and we're at total peace for that. Well, you may have felt a desire towards that, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. The door may even be open, which is what you're going to talk about in two weeks. But did it lead you in a direction that is contrary and, and, and com uh, completely opposite of the Scriptures? Yes, so that's how you can know in that moment that you have been deceived. So these other ways of hearing from God will never contradict what God has already written and what he has already said, which is why you have to know the Bible, which is why this has to be the foundation of your life. It has to be something you read regularly that you put in that way as you discern the voice of God, you can make sure what you're hearing is lining up with what you know to already be, be true. Because at the end of the day, it's quite easy for us as Christians, and especially pastors, they're really bad about this, of blaming everything on God. Oh, God told me to do this. And it's like, wait a second, that's way outside of Scripture. How would God ever say something to you that he's already said something opposite in his word? That just doesn't make any sense. But let's just be honest, in our human nature, we're really good at lying to ourselves, we're really good at convincing ourselves, oh no, that was the voice of God that told me to go and to do that or to say that or to think that. This is the way that we always know whether it was really God. So with that being said, um, we have to make sure we understand that the scripture is the first lens and all these other ones are secondary to what scripture says. See, the reason I start with the quick review from last week is that because the second way God speaks to us, it, it, it's something that we're going to talk about tonight, can easily be misinterpreted, misused, and actually abused if you do not first have the lens that Scripture is the ultimate way that you hear from God and know God's will. Without that, you can misuse and misrepresent God through these other six ways. So what we are dealing with tonight is the second installment of the Whisper series. And in the book, it says that the, another way that you can hear from God is through desire. Through desire. Now, that, that's an odd topic for Christians to talk about because honestly, in the church for a long time, in the church for a long time, they used to have this litmus test that Mark Batterson writes about in the book. Um, for centuries, people in the church would say, did you find pleasure in what you did? And if the answer was yes, they would actually convince people that what they had just done is sin. That if you ever did anything that actually made you happy, the church would convince you that you were wrong, that you had done something against the will of God. Because after all, everybody knows who's really studied the scriptures, what God wants most is for you to be miserable. Well, what he wants most is for you to be completely unhappy. He wants you to hate your life. He wants you to hate other people. He wants you to wake up depressed and miserable and angry. Everybody knows if you read the scriptures, that's what it says, right? No. No, not, not at all. In fact, the scriptures say the complete opposite, that God is for you, that he is for your joy, that he is for your um, good things happening to you. He is for blessing you. He doesn't want your life to be miserable. But, but sometimes, when we get on the topic of desire or things that bring about pleasure, churches and Christians and pastors have been really good of stamping that out of people and saying, no, those are bad. Don't listen to your feelings. Don't, don't give in to those desires. Don't give in to those pleasures. The reason why the church and pastors have done this for so long is that what they are trying to do is remove from you any chance of you falling into sin. So what they're trying to do is actually take away the liberty that you have in Christ because they say you are not able to handle these things. With these things, you will naturally just go on your own way and not follow Christ. And this is just an ignorant way of looking at the way that God has made you and the way that his spirit indwells within you. To say, sorry, you should just ignore your emotions, ignore your desires, ignore your dreams, ignore your pleasures, the things that make you, ignore those, stamp all those out. That's an ignorant way of looking at what God wants for your life. 
Now, is it true that emotions and desires and pleasures and passions have a shadow side that a lot of times do lead people into trouble? Absolutely. Absolutely. Feelings are not facts. They can definitely lead you away. Jeremiah 17 says that your heart is deceitful above all else. Who can understand it? It means that your heart, like the, the motto of our world, to go and follow your heart is a stupid, stupid, stupid decision and idea. Do not follow your heart. It, it does not work. But does that mean that your emotions are always bad? No. No, because God is the one that gave you those emotions. Does it mean that every aspiration and dream and desire you have is bad just because sometimes the aspirations, dreams, and desires we have can lead us astray? Well, yeah, they can lead us astray, but that doesn't mean that it's always bad. It's always bad. There's more to the emotion and desire and pleasure and pain and aspirations. There's more to it than the shadow side that leads us astray. Because God created you in such a way that when, when you really are in tune with him, your emotions and desires and passions can actually help you discern his will. It actually becomes another way of you knowing what it is that God is speaking to you. In fact, Psalm chapter 37, there's a great example of this. For those of you that are thinking, I don't know, Scott, what you and Batterson are talking about here sounds like you're going to give people the ability to go and to make some really bad decisions if they start following emotions and desires and what they want in life. No, no, no. Listen to, listen to where we come from with this. It comes from uh, Psalm chapter 37, verse 1. Do not fret because of those who are evil or, being envious of those, or, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. So David starts off Psalm 37 giving you this warning. People who follow after their own evil desires and do evil will ultimately not have things go well for them in life. It's just not going to ultimately go well. If you lean into your emotions, your desires, and your passions, and they leave you in, lead you in an evil, bad direction, it's not going to go well for you. There are, ultimate, there, are, there are ultimate consequences for sin. You know this and I know this. If you go and you cheat on your spouse and your whole family gets destroyed, that's a consequence of that sin. Not only are you guilty ultimately before God, but there's also consequences that we have to face. You go out and you get drunk this week and you wake up with a hang hangover, that's your consequence to face. Or you wake up and you did something really stupid when you were drunk. Yeah, that, that's a consequence that you have to face. Not only are you sinning because you're drunk, you also sin in your drunkenness. And, and so always sin doesn't just have this like cosmic consequence where one day you are going to stand before God and that's 100% true, that's going to happen. But Sin also has a gotcha in this life where when you follow your evil desires and passions and you let them lead you astray because you're actually pursuing your passions and your desires more than God, well, then you're ultimately going to end up reaping the uh, consequences of that decision. That's what David is saying. Ultimately, evil doers carry out evil because they are giving into the shadow side of those emotions and desires. They have not surrendered those emotions and desires to, to where they can be trusted to actually tell you what God is saying for your life. So our actions always start with an emotion, always start with some sort of desire. Before you ever do something, you actually have the desire to do it. And if that desire portion of you, your heart portion of you, is not surrendered and sold out to God, then those emotions and those des desires cannot be trusted. They will lead you away. So evildoers with evil desires ultimately David says, is going to get exactly what's coming to them. And verse 3 says, But trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. So he says, trust in the Lord. If you will not trust in yourself, not trust in your emotions and your desires as being the number one thing that matters in your life, but rather trust in the Lord, and then when you trust in the Lord, then you will do good, then your emotions and desires and pleasures and your aspirations will be sanctified. They will be good for you, and then they can be trusted. And, and what David says will happen, he says, then you'll dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Essentially what he's saying is where the evildoers, they're going to face consequences for following those evil desires and those evil ways that they want to do. Like they're saying, oh, this is what I hear. This is what I feel. I want to do this. They're going to reap the bad from it. David's saying, if you surrender and, and, and trust the Lord, then those emotions and desires you have from trusting the Lord will lead you into what the Lord actually has for you. And it will lead you to a good place. David says this is a much safer way to live, 
to live surrendered, trusting God, rather than trusting your own emotions and desires that can carry you away. And then verse 4, I love this. You may not even know, um, if you've not been around church much, you may not even know this is in your Bible, but I love this promise from David. Uh, and it's verse 4, it says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. W- wait a second. I thought desires were a bad thing, that I'm supposed to get rid of my desires and my emotions, I'm supposed to neglect them. No, that's just what the church has falsely taught for a long time because they, they forgot about Psalm 37.4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. This is a clear statement that your emotions, desires, and passions are not in and of themselves bad. In fact, your desires aren't bad. What it matters is where is your delight. And where your delight is, then you can have the proper desires. If, in fact, we delight ourselves in the Lord, then... We receive the desires from the Lord. So then the desires of your heart end up lining up with the will of God in your life. Then you delight yourself in the Lord. Your emotions, your desires, your passions are surrendered to him. And now you can be trusted. to, to Now those, those emotions and desires and pleasures can be trusted as a path in which the Lord may be walking you down. Does every desire that you have line up with Scripture? No. Every emotion you ever had make you react the way that Scripture says we should react in situations? No. Everything that you find pleasure in, is it according to Scripture? No, that's why we start with Scripture. But there are some times that we find this sweet spot where our emotions and desires and things that bring about pleasure in our life coincide with God's will. And we find that sweet spot and we know that that is the blessing of God. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, he gives the desires of our heart. But your desires will not be sanctified and holy if you have not first delighted in the Lord. My my guess is if you look at the way that God created you, your temperament, your personality, your build, there's something about you, my guess, that has a strong propensity for good but can also be a strong propensity for evil. Let me explain. So for me, God created me hyper, hyper, hyper competitive. I have a competitive nature like not many people I've ever met in my life. Like I was the kid, 13 years old, I got the last out of a Little League game and chased an adult around who called me out trying to fight him. That's me as a 13-year-old crazy, out of control, competitive. As I get older, now I'm a baseball coach. Do I get mad um, when things don't go my way? A hundred percent. And there's a part of me that goes, this emotion, this desire to win is evil. I should get rid of it. But then there's, uh, I was reading um, in Whisper this week, preparing this, that Mark Batterson, the author of the book, has the same competitive streak. And he was praying to God about it, and God said, I don't want to take that from you. Rather, I want to sanctify it and use it. Because the very competitive nature that I have on a baseball field, or that I had whenever I was little, or if I'm even just playing games at home with someone, like I have a hard time even letting my seven-year-old son win a game on PlayStation, that same thing that, that has this dark shadow side of it, whenever I lean into it and I use it in the wrong way, God can actually use that as a tool for me. When I'm competitive, that also means when I come to work, I'm competitive. And so I put everything that I have into what I do at work. And so God doesn't want to take away my competitive nature because it makes me want to be better um, at serving the kingdom of God. It makes me want to be a better father. It makes me want to be a better husband because I see everything like a competition. And, And when those desires are sanctified, God can use them to lead me in a certain direction. But whenever I choose to have my own selfish, stupid way with them, I cause a lot of destruction in my life. That's one example of when you delight in the Lord and he's number one, then that desire, the way that he made you, that temperament that you have, that thing that you find pleasure in, you can fully find pleasure in it when it's devoted to God, but if you try to seek it outside of God, it can actually bring destruction instead of delight and instead of pleasure. So when God is your delight, your desires will actually be God-honoring. As Christians, when we seek first to include God, then he can lead us to the path of our greatest joy, which is ultimately what he wants for you. 
So I don't, I don't think the church has always done a good job of telling you that. I was saying that earlier. I, I mean, we've, for centuries, the church tried to crush desire and passion out of people and said, no, Christians, take up your cross and follow Jesus it means that you're supposed to be miserable. And it's like, wait a second, you're missing, you're missing a lot of what the Bible has to say about God being for you and how he has blessings and pleasures for you. I, I'll just be honest, as, as a kid being raised in the, in, in, in the church, that was kind of my view towards Christians is they all kind of seemed miserable, honestly, because they were all kind of cranky. It, was, it, it always kind of seemed like they were always so cranky because they were trying to follow all these rules that none of them were actually fit to follow because they were so frustrated that they had to try to follow these rules and couldn't do it, and everyone else was not following the rules, and yet they seemed perfectly happy. And this group of people just seemed so cranky, and it was always like, why is this group of people so cranky? Like they sh- They're the ones that know God. They're the ones that's going to go to heaven and spend eternity with Jesus in his new creation. Why are these people so cranky and all these other people seem to be so nice and so I interpreted that as a kid growing up that to be a Christian meant that you had to follow rules and to be absolutely miserable and to not be a Christian meant that there was no rules and that ultimately you'd be able to be happy because you could choose for yourself and that honestly is what the church discipled into me and that's that's not the truth of scripture the truth as we read in Psalm 37 is ultimately evil people that follow evil desires will get exactly what's coming to them, but when you delight yourself in the Lord, then you will find the desires of your heart lining up with the will of God in your life. It's not because you're changing the will of God, it's that the will of God is changing you. In, in fact, if you have an issue with this whole idea that God is for your joy and pleasure, listen to Psalm chapter uh, 16. Uh, begin in verse 5, it says, Lord, you alone are my portion of my cup, you make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen in for me, in pleasant places, surely I have delight, uh, delightful inheritance. David's saying, there's something really good that God has in store for me. It's not being miserable. It's not um, being ho-hum all the time. It's not being depressed. God doesn't want to just keep you under his thumb. He actually has something really amazing for you. So David says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord with, my, with him at my right hand. I won't be shaken. So you're on sturdy ground when you choose to live your life this way. Therefore, my heart is glad. David's saying, when I I devote myself to God and I learn his instruction at night and I live according to his way, it actually makes my heart glad. So what I was seeing in those people in the church growing up that were always miserable is not what I should have been seeing. I should have seen people that delight to do the Lord's will and aren't cranky about it. So therefore my heart is glad, my tongue will rejoice, my body will also rest secure because you'll, you won't abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Yes, David just said, God is the author of eternal pleasures. Here we are looking all over creation for what brings pleasure and joy to us And David goes, listen, pleasures that will last forever, immense and total joy is only found in God. So you don't have to find delight anywhere other than God because you're afraid that you're going to miss out. That was always my story growing up. Here I saw all these cranky Christians. I was like, I don't want that. These people look like they're having fun. So therefore, I thought, let's go have fun because I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out on the parties. I don't want to miss out on um, the movies and the music and the sex or whatever it was. I don't want to miss out. So I went and and chased after all that. Because I thought if I did this whole Christian thing, I'd miss out. And now that I've lived for a Christian for almost a decade, I realized that, that that was actually missing out. And what I was missing out on more was this relationship with God that actually leads to a path of more joy than I could ever have found on my own. And so the more I delight in God, the more he leads me and guides me in a way that actually fulfills me. And it's when those times happen that my desires begin to lead me in the path. And so it's in those times when I'm fully delighted in God that I know that my desires are actually a way of me listening and hearing the way that he's directing me. See, God gave me and you emotions and desires and pleasures and passions. He gave us things to aspire for. He gave us um, a drive. And he doesn't want to squash those things out of you. Rather, he wants to fulfill those things totally within you. 
So, so what does this mean? That we have desires and passions and emotions and all this and they're not in and of themselves bad. How does this correlate to me listening and hearing from God? When your desire meets your gifting and your talents and, and what really fulfills you, then what happens is you end up trusting God in those areas and they guide you because ultimately he's for your joy. Just because something is good and pleasurable doesn't make it wrong, even if they have taught that for centuries in the church. It could actually be that you have so delighted yourself in the Lord that the Lord is leading you into your areas of greatest joy and desire and passion, and those things are coming together to form a sweet spot of joy in your life where you can fully enjoy that. For, for many years, I desired... I had the aspiration to be the lead pastor of Southridge Church. Was that a bad desire? Could I use that desire as a way to, to, do, um, to send me off in a wrong direction? To aspire? If it was all about just getting this position, but not about honoring God, that desire could have led me in so many different ways. And I just want this. But when you delight yourself first and foremost in the Lord, then your desires end up lining up with God's will for your life is is this ambition that we have in our life is it always bad sometimes ambition gets the best of us right sometimes it gets the best of us and send us sends us sideways and in unhealthy directions but a lot of times ambition can be used for your good and for the glory of God and for the good of others so just because something brings you joy and something is pleasurable it doesn't mean it's always bad the question that you have to continually ask yourself is, where is my delight coming from? Where, if I'm delighting myself first in the Lord, it should not be a surprise that the way he is leading me, as I'm listening to him, it, it shouldn't be a surprise that the way he's leading me lines up with what brings me joy, because that's ultimately one of the things he wants most for you. Now, before I just sign off there and you go, awesome, when I'm feeling good, that must mean that God is directing me in that way. Once again, you have to run it through Scripture. There's a lot of things that bring pleasure. There's a lot of desires that you and I have that are way outside the bounds of this. So it has to line up with this first and foremost. The second thing I'll tell you in closing, just to look out for, is that sometimes God asks you to do things that you have zero desire to do. And something, everything within you is fighting against it. You say, absolutely, I don't want to do this. That would be easy to listen to the first portion of this sermon and go, well, based on what Pastor Scott and Mark Batterson said, if it doesn't make me happy, it's not bringing me joy, then it must not be God. That's also not 100% true, which is why this whole thing of hearing God is a skill to, that, that builds your discernment to know what God wants from you. Because sometimes the thing God asks you to do is the thing that you least want to do. Sometimes the thing God asks you to do is the thing that you least want to do. You will have no desire for it. You will have no passion in doing it. You will have no pleasure in doing it. But that doesn't mean that he's not leading you to do it. But what we see time and time again is that over time, discipline in doing things that don't bring us pleasure, that we don't have a desire to do, ultimately brings about the desire. Ultimately, discipline can produce desire in your life. So, so perhaps you started a workout plan, and at first you never wanted to work out, and then you get a year into it, and you realize that you really like doing this. Eventually, discipline turns into desire. The first time that you open your Bible and begin to read, it may feel like a chore or like a job or a task, but, but two years down the road, it may be one of your favorite things to do because ultimately discipline turns into desire. So just because something doesn't immediately make you happy doesn't, all, doesn't mean that God is not in that as well. He may be stretching you. He may be trying to get something produced in you that your pleasure cannot produce in you, but only discipline and duty can do in your life. So how do I make sure that my desires and passions are leading me in the direction God wants me to go? First and foremost, go back to Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord. When Jesus is number one, that'll be a good 
uh, that'll be a good marker for, yes, the things that are coming out, the things I'm finding joy in are probably sanctified and are probably holy and good because I'm delighting myself in the Lord first and foremost. That's where you're finding your sustenance is in the Lord and not the things of this world. That's the first thing. The second thing, Jesus says this, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God, all these other things will be added unto you. When you keep Jesus as number one, focused, then your desires and your passions will likely follow. When you're diligently and passionately invested in a life-changing and transformation, transformative relationship with God, we will find that our true delight is in Him and He will lead us to the place of greatest joy. Are you going to have tough times? Absolutely. Are you going to have to do things that sometimes you don't feel like doing? Yes. But remember, joy is present despite your circumstances. Happiness comes and goes, but joy is present despite circumstance. So if God made you with emotions and desires and passions and things that that bring you joy, it would make sense that he knows the best way to guide you. So make sure you're listening. And when you delight yourself in the Lord, you'll realize that those things that bring you the most joy is actually along the path that he's leading you. These things are, are good and healthy when they're submitted, submitted and surrendered to God. They can help you discern the voice of God. I love what John Piper said. He said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. People around you see the best picture of God when they see you most satisfied in God and not in the things that you've got going on in this world. When you're more satisfied in God than you are your spouse or the prospect of a spouse, or your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, or your kids, or the prospect of kids, or, or, more glor- or your house, or your boat, or your car, or your job. Or your ba- the world around you sees the glory of God most in you when you are most satisfied with God alone and not anything else in the created order. So we have emotions, desires, and passions. Do not turn these things off. Don't let someone tell you that they're not good in and of themselves, just because they have a shadow side to them that can clearly be used to lead you astray. Decide to delight yourself in the Lord. Surrender them to, you, to Him. Make Him your delight, and those things will help lead you to knowing and hearing the voice of God. So what it is those things in your life? What are those things that you're like, I have a passion and desire for this, and I wonder if it's God leading me in that direction? Start here, and then spend a lot of time delighting yourself in the Lord. And I believe that answer will become clear to you. Start with Scripture, and then find your delight in the Lord. Let's pray. God, this is a a, a tough thing for us to do, to wrestle with these desires and aspirations and hopes that, that sometimes are selfish in nature and sometimes have a way of leading us further and further away from you. So I pray that, God, we would learn to be people that are so delighted and just so overtaken by who you are that our delight and our joy will always be wrapped up in you. And as we seek those things that we desire, ultimately we would be seeking you. I pray, God, that you would be our number one desire our number one thing that brings us joy is just knowing that you love us and you care for us. We love you. We thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen.